Welcome to the Tuka Talks show, where Tuka Tech founder Ram Serene talks to fellow fashion industry experts about the trending topics of today, the history of the apparel business, and the paradigm shifts that will transform the industry for the future. Greetings from Tuka Talks. Today's subject will clarify a lot of confusion in the fashion world. Like we always say, fashion is fit. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't sell. But how do we do the fitting? What is a fit model? Fit models is the Bible for any brand to follow. Today, I have the pleasure of having two of the most prominent fit models in the modeling world. My two guests today, you may have never heard their names, but I guarantee you, if you're in the apparel business, you have either used their measurements, their body, their avatar, or work with their brands that they represent. Help me welcome my friends, John Gallagher and Dale Noel. Dale, why don't you explain a little bit, how did you get started and who did you model sure. for? Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Dale Noel. I am a former fit model and I started in the early 90s and I got very busy very quickly. I was first in sales going around to trade shows and working in the showroom in New York City. And everyone would ask me, are you a fit model? You're a fit model. You should be a fit model. The designer at our company gave me her Bible of fit models and said, check this out. You should try it. I didn't do it right away. I loved my job. But uh, after about a year, I decided to call a few of the top um, companies in the world that work with fit models and started my first day. And on the first day, I got uh, the Gap, Calvin Klein, uh, Pepe jeans and one other major one. And throughout my career, I pretty much worked like John with all the majors, the Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, Oscar de la Rente, everything from low end to high end, because I would work the Walmarts as well. And when Michael Kors started his company, travel with him and work with all the major companies. So I had a great experience never thinking that I was going to be in this industry at all. Like I came from it, it's in my blood. My dad was a pattern maker and owned a factory, but he had nothing to do with me becoming a fit model. My grandmother, she was a seamstress and piece goods maker for PR Cardan. So we shared some of the same, same clients with my family, but no connection. And uh, I'm sure John has much to share too, but it's a fascinating industry and there's so much passion and technical knowledge that goes into getting everyone fitting great fitting garments and thanks for sharing what you have with us ram one more one more follow-up um what do you do now now i manage models um uh, my career came to a quick halt when i was uh, unexpectedly pregnant and about a couple months later diagnosed with cancer so within three months of being pregnant i stopped and I was always connecting people in the industry. My passion really is connecting people. So when I got pregnant, it seemed like the natural progression for me to manage people that over the years were asking me to help them out and manage them. So that's how True Model Management got started. Thank you so much. Um, John? Hello everyone, John Gallagher. Uh, yeah, Dale and I kind of started in the industry pretty much at the same time. Uh, with the same agencies too. So uh, we've run the gamut of clients. Um, for me, I started as a model and an actor and I was traveling you know, quite uh, extensively throughout the world working on the print side of things. So um, when I had the opportunity to do a fitting, uh, at the, the first time I didn't really understand what it was. And uh, so I went and, and met with a pattern maker and, and I got the job and it, one thing led to another. and one client led to another, and it, and it takes several years to build a broad base of clients just because of uh, just the way the industry works. You know, you can't 
just bring in a new model in the middle of a season. It kind of, it's a the seasonality has to be, you know, current with that, whoever they're using at that time. So it takes, uh, it, it takes years to build a huge client base, but Gail and I, because we've been in the industry for so long, have been able to do that and sustain that. And, uh, you know, we've had clients for, like Dale said, for decades and uh, it's been marvelous. John, I haven't seen you um, even on camera for almost 15 or 18 years. And I knew you for many years before. How do you maintain the same shape? I, well, I work hard at it. I just got off of a really nice four mile run, a little heated right now um, along the lakeshore here. I'm in Toronto right now. I'm heading back to New York this evening. Um, but it's passion, you know, I'm, I've been a passionate athlete my whole life. So uh, it's fortunate that th those two coincide. I need to stay the same size. And um, as long as you put the effort into it, you could maintain. It's all about the effort. Who would you say your most favorite designer that you modeled for, fit modeling? Well, Ralph Lauren has been my longest standing client now for, I think it's on 26 years and I'm still working with them. And uh, I admire Ralph as a person and I admire all the designers and tech designers. Um, it's just the company has run like a well-oiled machine for all these years and he's a humble man and an amazing company. But there's, there's so many, I, I can't, you couldn't name them all. I've worked with a hundred brands in my career and I'm very, very fortunate to have been able to do that and I'm still working um, and I'm still busy so I'm grateful for that well uh, one thing is for sure you have been a standard in designer world as what the garment measurement and the shape should be uh, my first bout um, of trying to understand a fit model and their role was back in early 80s, um, and I was trying to reschedule my appointment. I was asked to join a fit session at 11 o'clock in the morning, and I asked, can we do it at 1 o'clock? Everybody, and I mean everybody in that room, looked at me as though I was the craziest person. He said, we don't fit after lunch. So I asked a stupid question again, why? She said, because our measurements change. That's when I found out why it is so critical to have the shape and the measurements constantly and how and why they would actually validate to make sure monthly measurements and so on to make sure that the garment is not fitting. Tell me, why is that so important? Well, consistency in fitting and pattern making and production to get the clothes to the end consumer is key because you could have different measurements, you have different shapes. We really don't have a universal fit or universal size chart, we try. But the one thing that is, if you go to a brand, you love their classic fits, you've been shopping them for a, a certain amount of time, you rely on going back and you're going to be, if you stay the same, you want to be the same, pick up the same size and not have to, you know, return it and have issues with it. People rely on consistent fit. Uh, John, what is your view on that from man's point of view, man model point of view? Well, I think the, you know, the, the design intent of any brand, you know, you, you identify your consumer and then you, you target them and, and you sell to them and, and then there becomes this brand loyalty amongst your your customers so that's a really big thing to acquire a, a customer base you know and you want to retain them and you want to get more but you know if you're not consistent in your fit um it's a big problem right so this is why people like dale and i are able to if you have great sell-throughs with a brand and you have this really great relationship with designers and merchants and tech designers, and you can actually articulate and communicate what the end consumer is feeling before they get to experience it in a bad way. And then we make these changes um, when it gets to, to 
the stores and, and the sell throughs are great. That's the perfect scenario. And then you don't want to change that, which is why we're able to stay with a company for 25 years. Well, this raises one more question. There are fit models, and then there are fit models, and there are B fit models. B fit models may have way more understanding of how the product is built, where the adjustment is required, the feedback, so that we don't have to go through many iterations of changes before wash, as you said, after wash, what made the difference and so on and where to make the adjustment. Would you say it is crucial for a good fit model to understand how the product is made, how it's supposed to fit and where the adjustments are required and how to communicate those adjustments back to the patterns that's where the corrections are made. Absolutely. I, I th it, sorry, Dale. Um, you know, it's not always a pattern, but it, a lot of time it is. A lot of times it is to make and the stitch tension and whether you're using a binding on the inside of an, of an armhole or a binding on the back rise, you know, all of that comes into play. And I think the more experience you have, you understand that uh, and you can communicate to the tech designers that you're feeling a certain way because of the binding and maybe the kind of binding is not cut the right way. Maybe it's not just the binding, but it's whether it's cut on the bias or not. So there's so many things that come into play, all the different fabrics that, that companies use. Every single product category is different. Every brand is different. Every brand's idea of their ideal customer is different. So if Dale and I are going from one client to the next, mm -hmm. you know, we could be at five or six clients in a day. And we have to put on different hats for their mentality. Uh, it takes it takes some adjustments and but and, and that's the thing you know not everyone can handle that not everyone is like that so there's there's personalities involved there's the way you communicate with your design teams uh, and obviously there's uh, all the categories um, between brands you know that you have to keep true to your heart and in your heart you're not sharing any information any information with anyone so it's uh, mm -hmm. an interesting process yeah it's fascinating i agree with everything john sent and said and as far as there could be identical labels there's a you know a sample that says it's this 90 percent uh cotton 10 percent uh, last in whatever it is and then the model who knows the history of the the company and the styles and their blocks and the blocks were made on that model they know where on their body that should sit how much ease there should be what the pitch is like everything about that garment and the models who remember that and retain all that history and information and know all the competition they know when to call out the red flags and when to keep quiet it's it's a lot with uh being a liaison between different departments and being able to one, know it and then know how to communicate it and when to communicate it. But there are so many mistakes that I know the best fit models have caught that could have cost the company millions of dollars just because like John was saying, it was cut slightly off grain or they, um, you know, switch the role of fabric or they change the quality of elastic and, you know, it's not written down anywhere, but you could feel it and you know it on your body and you call that out to the team and then the research gets put in and garments get cut apart and you're like, wow, you know, that just saved, <laughs> you know, we're about to cut 10 million of those, you know, jeans or whatever the number was. And it can make a huge difference in a company's bottom line, having the right fit model. In the old days, when we had vertical design room, the designer, the pattern maker, the sample cutter, sewers, even the fit model was available. We literally took not weeks, but not days, sometimes only hours to get the image that the designer had in their head to the pattern, to a sample on a person by the afternoon. Today, if I had to look at what it's, the product is going to look like, it may take a few weeks or a few days. By the time I fit the garment and ready to go, it may take a few weeks, whereas it used to take a few days. Where is the efficiency? 
Sorry. I feel like it depends on the company. And some, when I travel, you know, overseas and you get so much done in a day and they come up with the idea and you fit it and it's done by, you know, the time you leave a day or two later. Um, in New York, my experience was the lead times were longer and everything. Even when the pattern maker was there, it was definitely better than when they had to ship the samples back and forth. But companies would work on, like it could be up to a year where you're working on one style. The turnaround yeah. time was so slow and they'd like make hundreds of garments just for one sample and make it in every color. And <laughs> I, what's your experience, John? I mean, cause I feel like it's become more efficient and we're seeing less samples now with the exception yes. of the one back in the earlier days where you were at the factory and you had all day to like stay there or wait uh, or traveling overseas. But, but from right, and traveling now, overseas, we could get it yeah, done that, in, that in a week. Um, I just think, you know, pro progress in general, and you can call it progress just for the sake of uh, technology. I mean, I think Ram wants the, an answer to is maybe, is, is it as efficient as it used to be? I mean, because we, we've been involved in this business now since when they were sending, uh, you know, that, that we were, there was no internet literally when, when we started, you know, so that's, it's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing uh, accomplishment. And, you know, the, the technology that has come out of the internet, you know, and creating these tech packs digitally, um, I think it has become more efficient. However, that there is, has been, uh, an attrition rate with pattern makers so they're not so involved the pattern makers are now more on the on the vendor side uh, you know, a lot some of the brands do keep a pattern making team but very few now um, mm -hmm. so there's a lot more um, time spent and and trust created with with vendors and factories uh, where before you know you had a, a lot more control so there's Absolutely. there's a give and take you're you're right. Uh, your top models working for top brands. Um, there are a lot of people who are much lower as far as the price points are concerned, or their recognition as a brand is concerned. Yet they all use some fit model or the other because that is their bible, so to speak, or a reference point. And not everybody could afford to send their fit models overseas to the suppliers. Before tech packs started, a designer would walk into a pattern room, say, hey, Sally, you remember we did that for such and such. It is same as with these changes. Somehow or the other, Sally understood what designer wanted. She went out and pulled out that block or that pattern, made the adjustments, cut it on a similar fabric, sewed the garment in the afternoon, showed it on a person. Say, is that what you want? Oh, yeah, but, and then, boom, we're done to the next one. In the name of trying to save money overseas, we started with tech packs, technical designers. I have seen some really bad technical designs coming out with specs that somebody did not even understand what the product was or how the garment is going to go over the head, over the shoulders, because there was no construction details put in there. First time when the garment arrives with the tech pack and vendor sending the garment back, do you ever hear in the design room from designers, this is not what I wanted? All the time. All too often. Yes, all too often. Yeah. So the question again comes back, what did we learn from this? Because I, you and I, all of us, we know the design process actually started when the first garment arrived. Because now that you, who has made the garment, have a copy of that, I can tell you what I want. To this garment, I want you to make this change, this change, this change, this change, and so on. A long list of changes. We haven't fitted the garment yet. It is still a look sample. It is, I don't like the way it drapes. I don't like the way the length is, and so on, whatever it could be. But the vendor is upset. Vendor doesn't understand. 
Now the vendor has a long list and wondering, what did I do all that effort for? I made it exactly what your tech back said. Yet we continue to do the same thing. 3D now has taken care of that a little, where the designers are able to create the look sample, internally add or subtract, make a change. But now we have created two more problems. And I want to hear if you agree or disagree with the views. The vendor who's making the pattern still has to make fit samples. And sometimes more than the number of fit models they were making before. Because now they are relying on the 2D data that was used to make the 3D garment to create a look sample. Using those patterns, if they made the garment and they put it on the fit model, it doesn't fit. Did anybody go into that yet to find out why? We know we can get rid of tech packs by adjusting on 3D communications and so on. Some people will get started right away and some people will eventually get up there and say, yes, tech packs were a big mistake. What do you feel is the next course as far as trying to get the fit sample right? How many fit sample iterations are going through now? The changes that are happening, you know, with technology, you and I, we, we sat together 20 years ago in LA and 3D was out then. I remember you showing me the video of the, of the virtual mannequin walking down the runway. So the, the ramp up that we're seeing today, uh, it didn't happen overnight. So there's a lot of hype behind 3D right now, uh, mainly because sustainability and the marketing behind uh, how 3D is going to change the world or, or help change the, the world uh, from a sustainability standpoint. My question is, why, I wonder why 3D took 20 years to get to where it is today when actually we had the technology back then. So uh, it's interesting that now there's this big push. And I know um, there's a huge learning curve. I mean, today the 3D is, to me, is just another tool. You know, it's, uh, it's nice that it's there. I hope it uh, will help companies create less, um, less samples. So the sampling, we can save money there. It will definitely help designers design. Um, and 3D is obviously, it's, every, it's in every business in the world today. So uh, it's going to be an incredible tool. I still think it's just going to be one of those things that you still have to create a garment and put it on your fit model. So for me, you know, I'm fortunate that I have all these mannequins around the world. And now my 3D mannequin is in software programs available to companies. And at the end of the day, I can actually have a, a try on session with, with a company that I don't normally work with because they're actually working with my 3D avatars and they're working with my mannequins without the humanized, without the human, right? Um, it's really difficult to just think that 3D is going to solve everyone's problems. Mm -hmm. I agree with John. I've been in many of the meetings since the early 90s. Very early on in my career, I was brought into a lot of the meetings and discussions about it. And from that time, even till now, it was always about, you know, how much it would cost, the learning curve, everything that would have to change, especially in the large companies, they were slower. Some of them were slower to adopt if they weren't the, the trendsetters and uh, the forward thinkers. But um, from internally at the company that we hear a lot with fearing losing their job. And then there was from the design aspect and tech and primary, they want it tactile. They want to feel it. They want to touch it. They want to know that it's real. You know, they didn't want to let go. And a lot of the people, when it started, they weren't tech savvy and 
computers weren't required. I remember when designers at major corporations were forced to start drawing on tablets and had to draw within parameters, like they can't just freely sketch. You know, that was a big thing. Like every designer had a different method of sketching and the proportions could be all off. So then when someone had to interpret it, they didn't know what that meant because the body was elongated and narrow or someone else's, you know, was just always in movement. So definitely putting it now into digital and like um, John was saying for the validation, because there is a way that you can have more consistency and accountability and transparency, all the keywords that everyone's saying today, it really is true. Things that you're talking about, Ram, I remember when I was a little girl, I was actually a fit model for my dad. I found out later that that's what I was doing. I didn't realize it, but you know, I used to go there and I was like the perfect size 10 for a while. So I would go to the factory and yes, we, the designer would come in and pull up that black pot, black pattern and fabrics were all like woven or most of them were woven then. And it was more standardized, you know, now you can have odd looking pattern shapes with these crazy always stretched fabrics and patterns oh, yeah. of difference. Everything, everything's changed. Cause even when I started fitting, everything was very structured, you know, and the angles and the measurements had to be spot on. Um, the grain lines had to be because there was not any room for error with the fabrics, you know, nothing, nothing would give. <laughs> um, but uh, I think a big fallacy or misconception today is that 3D is going to solve it and it's going to make it so much easier. At first, it's not easier. It's a lot of work. Uh, it is a big learning mm -hmm. curve. And for the patterns to really come out right, you need a very good pattern maker that can work in 2D and no tailoring in the fabrics and everything and work with the program. So uh, like both of you are saying, it is a tool. It's a fabulous tool. But most people in the industry believe you need a live model, a mannequin, and a 3D avatar, and you can validate on all of those. And if you need to change something, it needs to be reflected on all because you're not proving it just on one. Every one of them has something you know that isn't perfect about it, but when you have all three or more, you can find mistakes, keep things more consistent. Both of you have touched some very interesting points. Um, I'll go to John's first and then I'll come back to yours. Um, yes, 20 years ago, we had the 3D technology and that technology was based on certain data that we put together. Um, I, I am an engineer by profession and um, I've benchmarked automotive industry all my life. Um, the, the product development in automotive industry uh, requires a crash test for the safety of their product. And in old days, it used to cost approximately $100,000 to crash a car. Um, and that was when only the lap belt was there. There were no, not even a harness belt. Forget about all the newness that came in that we will come to your point about the different fabrics and so on. But even then, we were trying to find how A, we avoid crashing the actual car and get that data digitally that was done through D 3D with the sensors and so on. How do we measure the impact of that to the extent that we are now able to not only go head-on collision, but colliding from various points with various forces to be able to see which bag will do the best thing. So there's a technology used in the right direction to improve the product and lower the cost of the product. Can you imagine running all these 3D tests for every simulation and then really crash the car to see if your data is correct? Would that be appropriate? Obviously not. That would not be a technology. But having a little bit pregnant kind of approach we are a 3D technology being used in apparel, but we are still making the garment to make sure what we see is what we're going to get. How it's fitting is what's going to fit, but we are not there yet. So, so 
if if I go back to first point of John, there were three things in there. One was who the fit model is. We had to get that fit model's body to the same standards that we had between before lunch and after lunch to make sure that whatever that fit model's body shape, measurement, and even the posture is, we capture that in the system. And second, get that fabric, the exact behavior of the fabric in a digital format to be able to see how it drapes and how it stretches and so on. And the third one was the motion. What we asked fit model to do, is it this, is it this, whatever the motion is, Unless we had all three, there was a little bit pregnant. Until today, that's what it is in most of the technologies. I'm not here to talk about my technology. I'm basically pointing out certain facts that if we don't have all these ingredients, then we need to work on getting those ingredients because it is getting very, very complicated industry with different fabrics, different constructions, different washes, at the same time, different styling and so on. And how do you put all of this together into a digital world? The objective is to reduce the cycle time for product development and approval. And yes, if you remember, John, when you came in 20 years ago, we were making fit forms. And we'd body scanned you. And if you remember the fit form that we made, it had the same texture as the skin of the human body, and it had the same pliability of the skin and the muscle and so on as the human body does to the garment. When compare that to cloth covered, you can have the garment sit here, garment sit here, it'll cling with each other and still don't have the same details. If we were going to have a replica with dummies, why was it taking still five and five and a half iterations before a sample was getting approved? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to that question. You mm -hmm. know, so uh, we, it has been reduced since the, the implementation of, of humanized mannequins that, uh, and I got into that business not to, uh, not to like, cover the market with John Gallagher mannequins. It was just an opportunity for me to, to serve my clients in a better way. So we could actually reduce those samples. And I, and I can say over the years with the, uh, the advent of the mannequins that are in use right now, um, we have reduced our, our fit approval times. We've cut it in half, which has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously there are challenges with certain fabrications as Dale alluded to you know the textile world is ever changing and and it's it's interesting it's fascinating and but they're new there's a lot of newness there that uh, you, you don't always get it right four-way stretch you know it's like and then and then the, the, there's the other thing is the, the designers intent of what they want to use that fabric for and how they want to use it so you know we're we're not there to dictate you know the fit as that it has to fit us a certain way so it grades to the rest of the masses. We also have to take into consideration the designer's intent for that specific garment. So it might feel like it doesn't really fit right, you know, but there's if it's got a drop crotch or, you know, really, really wide legs and then a narrow leg opening, which is what's going on now. You know, we're getting more back, going back towards the 90s today, which is interesting because, you know, in, in the early 90s, everything was really big. So it was not that difficult to make a, especially in the men's world, it may have been different in the women's world, um, but everything was pretty oversized. So it was, it was pretty easy to make a, a garment that fit well. And, and then everything got so, so slim. And, you know, that's when it became really, really difficult. And then stretch, the advent of stretch from denim to every fabric you can imagine, um, it, it eased up the intensity of like how difficult it is to get a good fitting garment. But, well, one thing is for sure that fitting a man's body versus a woman's body, there are different challenges, way more, way more challenges because of the curves and so on and the garments. And as you said, 
the styling from the baggy to the fitted four way stretch has been a blessing for the designers, especially in the women's apparel, because a little bit of inefficiency of the product can kind of get hidden up till you see from the tension map, where is it really cutting in? It's a blessing for the designers, but it hasn't been a blessing for the factories because, mm -hmm. you know, every role is different. Everything has to be tested. Yeah. They all, they all shrink different. Like, so it's a, it's a, it's great at the end use and the consumer has benefited greatly from it, but it's not, it has not been an easy. Oh no, it's a technical challenge for, um, for the factories. Um, and you're right. Uh, that's another big subject. We can get on to that one. Um, I've done a lot of work in that area with Pakistan, where we're doing a lot of new uh, women's apparel. Um, but going back into the um, men's and women's, uh, for example, large size women, it's very hard to find a large size woman or a child to maintain the same shape for a long time. So yes, fit models like that to be captured in a digital format and then standardizing becomes a huge blessing for the entire supply chain. When it comes to posture, a large size woman standing erect versus standing slouching, the whole garment drapes differently on the screen versus even the person. That's another, another challenge. In California during um, 2019 and uh, uh, before that, uh, before COVID, people would go to 12, 13 markets a year. In every market, they have 100 to 500 new styles. They didn't have the time to go through the tech packs and so on. They did internal. But these guys were doing physical samples through first production pattern makers. They were not the greatest pattern makers. They would just slap a product, whatever designer wanted, into a garment and make a cute garment. We go to the market, when we come back with the orders, the first thing the production pattern makers did was throw away the first pattern's pattern and start from that style what the garment is going to fit like. I'm going back to the 3D visualization of a product, which is now being accepted by the industry thanks to COVID, but fit models are still fitting the garments. Most of the vendors are complaining that they are being asked to make exactly the same sample. And every one time that the garment goes out, it comes back with a lot of fit comments. And the only thing I can relate that is that the fit model's body and the digital avatar is not exactly the same. Any any uh, input on that? Yeah, and also it could be the every designer is not the same either, and and their their requirements and their expectations of samples coming back from factories to uh, you know to be fit or to be even looked at by the tech design teams. Uh, every brand has their own level of of uh, expectations of their factories and I, I believe there should be zero tolerance for samples coming back you know and I know that's a lot of pressure to put on a factory but you know why should we have tolerance on samples zero tolerance is yeah I, I I know it's next to impossible but that should be the expectation we'll get closer to approvals much faster I think if that kind of not I don't want to call it pressure but that that expectation is is put on the factories and the vendors to the factories but there's a lot of mind changing that goes on in the business. And I think, you know, one of the things that can help the world as a whole is, is that to have that drop dead date where there are zero changes can be made from here on out, you know? So I think one of the, one of the good things that happened with uh, the slowing down of the process during COVID is that people are really looking at, what did it what do we really need in our line you know there's so much so much over assortment in the industry that doesn't need to be that way i think that's where we're going to see a lot of, of great things happening with uh, at the end of the day samples right so it's reduction of, of all of it and i guess <laughs> what everybody wants is just so much out there right now 
uh, and we don't need it and no yeah. one needs it. This is the reason why I love you guys because you guys see that firsthand. I've been saying this based on data only. You're 100% correct. COVID has actually expedited that process and asked the people to make what you need or what we call demand manufacturing, sell and then make it. Then everybody knows it already has a home. My prediction is the next revolution, the fourth revolution will come from manufacturing. More manufacturing will be done, but more manufacturing will be done locally with local resources. China will make for China, India will make for India, US will make for USA. And if there are some basic products which has no time stamp or season stamp or risk, yes, we will make it in the country where we can get the cheapest possible labor or the best possible cost because the risk factor is very limited. But when it comes to day-to-day -day styling and new products and so on, it'll be no different than we will eat what is grown in the backyard or in this, rather than bringing the produce from across the world, right? We've seen that in the 19 months that over 200 factories have opened up across the globe, 78 of them in the United States. These are not small factories, anywhere from 15 people to 200 people and growing, and they're all making money. The risk factor is the one which has been mitigated. The, the fear factor that making in America is very expensive has been overcome with use of technology and technical know-how rather than working with the same business models. Um, back in 2008, I did a project for a brand in India and I, I worked backwards. I took their spec for medium size and then <clears throat> whatever their 3D fit model was, I scaled the models for every size as per their specifications to show if the human bodies don't grow the same way as the garments, the grading information was growing. And it was visible to be able to see um, and that made them look at maybe we should not be fitting only on one size. We should be also looking at how would the garment look for the size up and up and up and down and down and down to be able to see how we can have a better sell through. Yes, we should be trying on one person, but we should be fitting on a lot of other people. Any views, any suggestions on that? Yeah, I absolutely think that if you have one standard and that is the one that you're collecting data on, tracking, everyone knows that body or that avatar or that mannequin, then that is your standard. Trying on many people is great as long as they're doing it in an organized and methodical way that they know what the differences are and how the proportions are the same or different. Just randomly throwing on people, I mean, it'll work to some degree, but I think it has to have a little more thought into it than many of them do, because they will sometimes just say, oh, just try this on in the office, you know? And when you were talking about, you know, making locally and um, streamlining, I think all that is super important. And also having the same tools and making sure that everyone's on the same page, because I find so many uh, brands, they'll use one program, you know, even if it's digital, one program to design and one to do tech packs in, one to make the patterns on, another to, you know, make their final samples. The factory has something completely different again. So I feel like even within the same company in the factory, they reiterate and like transfer, things get lost in translation and in transfer. And uh, also the factories a lot of time are recreating the wheel. So if everyone was just decide yeah. which program they want to start in and follow it all the way through, it could be you, you can, can you, <clears throat> you can make it even more complicated when you look at not just one brand and one factory this factory may be working with 10 brands or 50 retailers or various countries the fit is different for each one it's probably the same category so now the factory's problem is multiplied 10 times or 50 times depending on the number of 
company that they are catering to or brands they are catering to. Uh, you're right, the technology will kind of um, bring that problem in forefront and then ask you or if you can analyze how to fix that. Um, grade rules is extremely, extremely vulnerable from the old technology and this new technology in 2D and 3D and quick visualization kind of gives us, rather than creating a Missy or a, a contemporary line and then having different size sets and for every one of them, why don't we have a difference between this body to that body and capture that as a grade rule. And then from this body to next body, capture that as a grade rule and so on. So you can create less number of styles and still fit a lot of lot lot more people properly. Um, I know I've taken a lot of time of both of you. What I'm going to ask each of you as a closing remark, if you had that magic wand, knowing what you know, because you know a lot besides just fitting, what would you wish for? What would you suggest or advise? Let's start with you, Dale. Well, first, I think from even a basic level before computers and everything, it's communication. I feel that the communication gets misconstrued and lost and the, people don't even within the English language don't use the same language sometimes. And working across multiple countries, um, it can get even more diluted. I think there needs to be studies on multiple levels and that everyone has to get on the same page as far as the design, the fit, the consumer, and the factory expectations, because the expectations are sometimes not realistic, or sometimes they're, they're very lax. And if everyone came together and just had, within a brand, I'm not saying that every company has to do the same, but they had one like universal dialogue language. And I believe they should have the deadlines too that I believe John was mentioning first so that it's like, you know, design gets X amount of time. And of course there's always gonna be exceptions, but like to stick to the calendar and use the, all the tools that they have. Because if I feel some companies have the tools and they don't really use them or they don't use them properly. So for me, it's all about education, I think. Um, to, like when you were talking about making in the USA, I would love more to be locally and made in the USA personally. And we need to invest in the infrastructure though, as well as training. Cause I feel like training is key. And when people are educated, they're making better decisions and better products come out of it. So I feel that companies really need to realize there isn't a magic wand even if you buy a 3d program it's not going to solve all your problems and it will take time so in the beginning it might take more time and money but for the long run it'll be a better product better for the environment better for the consumer for everyone wonderful john well if it, if it was my own brand I, you know it's all for me it's partnerships, 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 you know, create this wonderful culture within the brand that transcends the brand to the vendors. So everyone feels like they're part of the same company. Unfortunately, a lot of factories don't feel like they're part of the brands that they actually manufacture for, especially on the lower end when, when the pressure is so intense and the quantities are huge, there seems to be uh, a, more of a disconnect between the brands and those vendors and factories. So. Uh, and, I, and I like that concept of having these continental factories where that's where you manufacture. And I don't think it's just America. I think it can be North America because here in Canada, there's a, an incredible amount of manufacturing going on, which is amazing. Collaboration. My father used to say, this is one and this is one, but together they are 11. The power of collaboration is absolutely the strongest one, the unity in strengths. Having said this, I'm going to give you one more um, food for thought. Okay, that's my parting comments. Um, you said that you've been doing it now 20 plus years, and we mentioned how it is very difficult for a child to retain their own shape or a large-sized woman 
or a man to retain their own shape. Um, when I started making body forms, these were the first body forms. Lane Bryant was the first, first customer to capture that woman and then make sure that we always have that body. Same thing with uh, big and tall area for the casual male. Um, again, in your personal careers and your fit models that you manage, they all have a certain window in their business, correct? Can technology capture that forever and get royalties to you in such a way that you feel that you can be advisors with all the technical know-how that you have and allow the vendors and brands and the supply chain to use the bodies um, and still maintain the same uh, know-how, so to speak. And I'm going to give an example. Um, I started this about a year and a half ago with selling patterns, basic construction patterns for basic products. Um, most of the patent making services ask anywhere from $100 to $500 for that. The garment pattern that fits perfectly. And I started selling for $5 on the internet. But believe it or not, when I'm selling hundred of those or two hundred of those or five hundred of those, all of a sudden that pattern is not five dollars revenue for me. It is now a thousand dollar revenue for me and it's still going to be the cow that continues to give milk because a t-shirt or a jacket or a pant or a whatever, the, the, the fit is going to remain the same, the patterns are going to remain the same and it will continue to give revenue. Having used the same analogy in the fit modeling where you're doing one garment, regardless of whether it is a brand being using that data of your body or the vendor or somebody, but for that style, however number of times, if some mechanism can be made, do you think that has a future in the 3D industry? Absolutely. I mean, anything is possible. You know, I, I, I would suggest that all the fit models out there, and I, I didn't know when I first got involved in the, uh, in the mannequins and, and obviously now it's all digital uploads uh, for the 3D. Uh, I had to go out and hire an, an IP firm to represent me to make sure that I, everything that all of my IP, all of my digital data that I own. Right. So, um, it's not an easy thing, but we've man managed to do it. So now I know, you know where all the uploads are and, and uh, you know, many people thought it was gonna put me out of business and it only helped my business and, and it really helped grow on a global scale. You know, how I am represented on the, men, on the men's side for the industry. But yes, that whether it's by one upload and you're, char you're, you're charging a fee for the year for usage or it's by the piece, well, you know, that. There, there, is, there, there are technologies available to even track. And Dale and I have been working on this one for a while now. Um, we know exactly who opened, who saw, who touched, and so on. And uh, it's just a matter of um, tacking on to an affordable fee. It's, it's, um, it's a valid concern from vendors who are really, really struggling to make sure that they can offer the discount and still comply with all the compliance and all the new technologies and invest in this one and that one and so on. <clears throat> Let everybody be involved in this expense ratio versus just one person being the scapegoat for... Uh, that's why it doesn't work, okay? You've got to share the risk and like John said, you've got to collaborate. You've got to create a partnership. And partnership is not about me, me, it's us. That's been, I feel, the roadblock in a lot of it with the tracking because we've found the software and worked with the developers who have that, that you could track it anywhere, anytime, by the minute, like, you know, everything about it, who it is, not just by the year. But we need that price to come down for that to work. But in the meantime, I think what everyone is doing, I completely support the scanning uh, done with the right uh, 
protections and uh, fit models, I believe, are consultants anyway, even when they're on the job, but with their working with their avatar and they're not there and the company needs like a consultant that is the perfect um, team that they can work with. And I models definitely should have, you know, royalties given to them while they're uh, giving their IP and their shape and their body. And it can live forever. There are some fit models that you fit a pair of pants on them and it fits the masses and others, they could be the same measurement, same, almost seem the same, but something's just different about the anatomy. So the ones that really have the, you know, best clients and have the best sell throughs in the industry, I feel like there are a select few that this really will work great for. I don't know if it'll work for every single person who tries on clothes for, you know, different brands, but definitely from the top like you, John, I think uh, it's fantastic and keep up the good work. Wonderful. Well, <clears throat> This is how we do it, where I grew up. Thank you, thank you both very much. El for, Good for to see you again, my friend. Time. Yes, sir. And it's always a pleasure to learn from both of you about the insides of the fashion industry. And thank you for sharing your views. And please watch if there are any comments or questions from the people who subscribe to this and, and do respond to them. Thank you so much again. Thanks for listening to this discussion presented by Tuka Talks. If you found something in this conversation insightful, we would love for you to click the share button and send this episode to a friend. 